Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, the Bezos bombshell. Amazon CEO accuses the parent company of the National Enquirer of blackmail and extortion in an explosive blog post that name drops the Saudi government and President Trump. Plus, the fallout for the publisher AMI. Federal prosecutors are now looking at how the National Enquirer handled its coverage of Bezos's extramarital affair and whether a crime was committed. And as if there wasn't enough Bezos-related news, Amazon is now reconsidering plans to build a second headquarters in New York City after a wave of backlash. We will hear from a New York senator who calls that a different kind of extortion. But first, to our top story, even the world's richest person couldn't stop a nude selfie leak. But... Don't call him a victim just yet. In a bombshell blog post, Jeff Bezos accuses the publisher of the National Enquirer of extortion and blackmail, including apparent corroborating details to prove it. The National Enquirer fired the first shot last month after publishing an expose of Bezos' extramarital affair. Now, Bloomberg is reporting federal prosecutors are reviewing whether the Enquirer's parent company, AMI, engaged in criminal activity in its handling of the Bezos story, which might violate an immunity agreement tied to hush money payments made to women who claim to have had affairs with President Trump. And the Amazon CEO and owner of the Washington Post says he isn't done yet. He is continuing an ongoing investigation into just how the tabloid got sensitive photos and texts tied to his affair. And he has pointedly suggested that even the Saudi government has a role in this story, leaving us with the ultimate cliffhanger, writing, quote, I prefer to stand up, roll this log over, and see what crawls out. Wow. Joining us now to discuss, Bloomberg's Greg Farrell, an investigative reporter on our legal team, and Bloomberg Business Week's Max Schaffin. So, Greg, let's start with what's crawled out. So far, what exactly are prosecutors looking at here when it comes to AMI? Uh, they are going to try to determine, uh, Emily, to what extent um, this was actually just reporting that was uh, generated by the National Enquirer's own staff, or if they got any help, if there was any kind of coordination with any political actor. And I think we saw in Jeff Bezos's note, not just possibly the White House, the administration, but perhaps people working on behalf of Saudi Arabia. So that's a much bigger, more explosive component to this. Now, Max, there are so many dots here that Bezos has thrown out there that aren't connected yet, that may not be connected, but my assessment of this was this was sort of the nuclear option given what he has at stake running a public company. What is your assessment of the personal and professional risk that Bezos has taken? You know, we've been talking for a better part of a year of kind of the rise of Amazon, the growing power of Jeff Bezos becoming, you know, the world's richest man, watching Amazon, you know, just take over one industry after another and just become this, you know, incredibly unstoppable economic force uh, in the world economy. And I think this is a power move. I mean, this is this is Jeff Bezos, um, you know, sort of taking advantage of his platform, his, you know, that, that the fact that people respect him, the fact that he is associated with this, you know, great newspaper, The Washington Post and really uh, doing something to the National Enquirer that I don't think they expected or really anybody expected. It it was uh, stunning, and then to see that you know kind of on the heels of of these you know Super Bowl ads, one of which was sort of like this crazy ad just showing how powerful Amazon is. They've got you know Mark Kelly turning off the lights for the whole world, and then uh, today with the the real estate thing where you have uh, people in New York City you know kind of complaining about Amazon, and Amazon comes out with this kind of um, saying that, you know, they're willing to walk away from this deal. So I think this is just another example of the basically the power of Amazon and, and its uh, founder and CEO. He's also, of course, the owner of The Washington Post, and he talks about the complexities of that in his blog post, uh, saying, my ownership of The Washington Post is a complexifier for me. It is unavoidable that certain powerful people who experience Washington Post news coverage will wrongly conclude I am their enemy. President Trump is one of those people, obvious by his many tweets. We've been talking about this word complexifier, which I believe he invented, but I kind of like it. Um, but let's talk about what's at stake. You know, dropping the president's name here, not knowing for sure what that actually means. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty interesting because at the beginning of the Trump administration, we saw, uh, you know, Bezos going to these, uh, you know, panels with President Trump, kind of, n n I wouldn't say it was quite like charm mode, but but definitely trying to find a way, I think, to work with the, uh, with the administration. And now, I mean, this is uh, pretty much, you know, returning fire. You know, the, the president has been sort of tweeting at, at, at Amazon CEO for, for a long time, you know, calling uh, the Washington Post the Amazon Washington Post. And now, you know, this is, he's striking back. And, and you know, I think there, there, this is going to be potentially open war. Now, Greg, there's a whole complicated web of relationships at play here between AMI and the president and who knows, maybe even, even the Saudi government. What exactly is next when it comes to whether or not criminal activity was committed here? Well, first of all, you've got um, the National Enquirer uh, as part of the settlement involving Michael Cohen last summer and the payments to Stormy Daniels that were basically uh, hidden campaign contributions. Because of that legal settlement and the non-prosecution agreement that the National Enquirer's parent company entered into, uh, the company, the magazine, has been in the penalty box. They have, a, like, basically the the, uh, the equivalent of a three-year stint in the penalty box where they, you know, go and sin no more, don't do anything wrong. So if there's a determination here, and this is the last thing I'm sure they want is to have federal prosecutors looking at this, if there's any determination that, in fact, you know, they've gone to the well again, they're doing something that basically amounts to a campaign hit piece or something that, you know, should be construed, you know, as an end-around campaign, uh, you know, contributions or political support, this would be very bad for them. Years ago, I helped our coverage um, based in London of phone hacking at uh, a tabloid owned by Rupert Murdoch. And it took years and years for the allegations of that to finally explode into the public eye in 2011. And when they did, it was extremely damaging to uh, Rupert Murdoch. It uh, basically thwarted his attempt to buy the rest of uh, Sky and um, it had real damage. The fact that Jeff Bezos is behind this you know, helps this jump, you know, over the years and years it took, you know, for the phone hacking scandal to explode. This is now going to be front and center and it's going to be uh, investigated very thoroughly and it could be very damaging to AMI, but also have political ramifications, again, for the White House and for pe anybody who is involved, a supporter of President Trump, who tried to facilitate and make this happen. And, of course, Bezos is trying to figure out just how did the National Enquirer get his text, get these explicit photographs. AMI, for its part, saying American media believes fervently that it acted lawfully at the time of the recent allegations made by Mr. Bezos. It was in good faith negotiations to resolve all matters with him. The board has convened and determined that it should promptly and thoroughly investigate the claims. I mean, certainly, you know, if all of this is true, Max, it cannot be mistaken as journalism, but it's also an interesting evolution of Bezos here, who, for the first two decades of building his company, was a media-shy CEO who avoided the spotlight. And in the last two years, he's, washed, he's, he's bought the Washington Post. He's taken on Donald Trump. He's sitting next to Roger Goodell at the, at the Super Bowl and running uh, a, a commercial uh, claiming that democracy dies in darkness. What do you make of the evolution of Jeff Bezos I mean, in the last few years? You know, I think there, there are probably a couple of ways to, to, to look at it. And, and one of them is, is maybe this is personal. Maybe this is uh, Jeff Bezos, you know, deciding he's got a lot of money. He wants to have a little fun or, 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 or something along those lines. I think a more uh, a sort of uh, maybe a, a more cynical way to, to look at it would be that Amazon um, suddenly has a lot of power. And we're, we're, we're talking about a time when tech companies are kind of uniquely vulnerable or vulnerable to, in a way that they haven't been for a long time to say uh, both uh, presidential as well as congressional oversight. And I think this is, you know, this is potentially a, a communication strategy. All right. Well, certainly lots remains to be seen. He opened up a lot of strands here of speculation. Our Max Chapkin of Bloomberg Business Week, Bloomberg's Greg Farrell, thank you both for joining us. Coming up, believe it or not, there is another big Amazon story today. After announcing its new headquarters would be coming to New York City to much fanfare and controversy, Amazon is now considering pulling out. That's next. This is Bloomberg. The fate of Amazon's HQ2 in New York has been a topic of constant debate amidst a wave of opposition from city leaders 
and residents. Now, Amazon is considering pulling the deal off the table. Congresswoman Alex Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez took to Twitter to celebrate the development. Can everyday people come together and effectively organize against creeping overreach of one of the world's biggest corporations? Yes, they can. Now, the deal hasn't closed yet, and it must be approved unanimously by the State Public Authorities Control Board. I spoke to one of the most vocal critics, New York State Senator Michael Gianaris, a Democrat who represents Long Island City, and a member of that board who has to approve the deal. I asked what he thinks about this new report that Amazon might back out first. This is the type of extortion by Amazon that's got us into this mess in the first place. Uh, they think they could sit there uh, in Seattle and dictate terms and hope that governments bend to their will. Well, it's not going to work. Uh, Three billion dollars is uh, for Amazon to come here is, is, is uh, an outrage, and it always has been. And if their view is they will only come here if they get to dictate terms and do things their way, then maybe they shouldn't come. Now, lay out your argument for us, because we're talking about thousands of jobs here. Senator, why don't you want Amazon in your city? Uh, well, that's, that's a loaded question. It's not uh, what I've said at all. Uh, what I've said is jobs are good, but we need to get them the right way. Uh, and we shouldn't be subsidizing them to the tune of $3 billion plus. Google is bringing 20,000 jobs to New York uh, with a minimal, if any, uh, sub public subsidy uh, involved. Now, if I'm Google and I see that Amazon is successful in extorting $3 billion from this state, I'm on the phone the next day saying, well, where's my money? And then, and then so on and so on and so on. This is a, a discussion that should be taking place on a national level about whether this is the right way to engage in economic development policy in this country. Uh, we are throwing our public dollars at the wealthiest of the wealthy and hope that we get some of it back due to their activity. That's, that's Reaganomics. That's trickle-down economics that was discredited a long time ago. And I don't know why uh, people like Andrew Cuomo are the biggest champions now of, of corporate welfare in the hopes that uh, the largesse of the wealthiest among us might somehow benefit the common man. But is there a risk, New York, or a political price that you could pay if Amazon just withdraws and focuses on Virginia? Well, that's not what's motivating me, and so that will be whatever it will be. Uh, I'm doing the right thing by uh, the people of the state and by the people I represent, uh, and uh, the chips will fall where they may. But uh, I have a sneaking suspicion, and public polling has confirmed this, that when asked if uh, it's worth $3 billion in subsidies to have Amazon here, the public says no. So have you heard from Jeff Bezos at all? No, I have not. I think he's busy. <laughs> <laughs> he, he has been very busy, it seems. What is a message that you would like to deliver to him? Well, I would say they should start acting like a responsible corporate citizen uh, and stop exacerbating the concentration of power that's moving uh, way too much in the direction of uh, private corporate interests in this country. They are sitting there dictating to governments of this country how much money they want, making them compete with each other, forcing them to sign secrecy agreements, and then threatening to leave if they don't get their way. Well, that is not the way to operate, and New York does not need to bend to Jeff Bezos' will. Uh, so we, uh, I'm going to continue uh, fighting for my neighborhood, my state, uh, and I think this is an issue that uh, should receive uh, national attention. If we can reframe the debate about corporate welfare and subsidies of these kinds of projects, we'll have achieved a lot. Europe doesn't even permit this. Okay, so we are off in a very strange uh, a direction where the corporations are, are dictating policy more and more. It started with the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court. Uh, we've seen in Seattle when Amazon doesn't like something the local city council is doing, it, it flexes its muscle and gets them to reverse their course. This is very dangerous. Okay, public uh, governments exist to be an, an avenue for the public to express itself and to make decisions about itself. If we're going to cede that to corporate powers, we're going down a very dangerous road. If there was one thing that Amazon could do to change your mind, what would that be? Well, it would have to be several things, but they could start with saying, all right, we realize this deal is not a good deal for the people of New York. We're going to throw it away. Uh, that would be the first step that would be necessary. What if Amazon agreed to spend the incentives on schools, on infrastructure, on improvements to the community, other benefits? Would that change your mind? Look, I'm not here to negotiate with you or have hypotheticals. The fact is, and today's uh, activity and statements by Amazon and their representatives makes clear that they're not interested in, in having uh, real conversations about what, what it would take. Uh, all they're saying is, this is what we want. If we don't get it, we're leaving. And if that's their view, then they should leave. Now, 
the mayor and the governor had sa has said that no elected official wants to take the risk of costing the city 25, 40,000 potential jobs. Are you saying you're willing to risk your career on this? I guess I'm saying they're wrong. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And maybe they don't want to risk their careers on justifying $3 billion to Jeff Bezos. Uh, because that's the real question here. And let me let me speak a little bit about these jobs. Uh, New York City, uh, over the last several years, has been creating about 90,000 new jobs every single year. So you break down those 25,000 they're promising over 10 to the 10 to 15 years that this deal would call for. You're talking about maybe 2% of the city's normal job growth. It's not insignificant. I'm not saying that at all. But it's certainly not an earth-shattering uh, uh, figure that will alter the course of New York City. But allowing them in here without uh, a real uh, effort to talk about what the community needs, what the state needs, and not giving them all this money that we could certainly use somewhere else, uh, I think is, uh, is a real problem. Now, we can't go back in time, but I wonder, is there anything differently that Amazon could have done in the selection process to win your support, to win the support of your colleagues? Well, you're asking me a lot of hypotheticals, but the fact is they have a, a, a worldview and they have a way of doing things, and that's why we are where we are today. If the public was let into this process a year ago, uh, instead of forcing governments to sign non-disclosure agreements, if they were actually uh, had an open process where the public can express themselves in terms of how far uh, they were willing to go or what they would uh, require back, that's a very, very different conversation. They did not want to have that conversation, and now we are where we are. That was New York State Senator Michael Giannaris. We did reach out to Amazon for comment on the proposed appointment of Giannaris, but have yet to hear back. Coming up, the electric scooter frenzy continues as Lime continues a new and massive round of capital, closes a new and massive round of capital, how the company plans to take on new competition and prove scooters really are the next big thing. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Electric scooter startup Lime announced this week it has raised $310 million in new funding. The Series D funding round, led by Bain Capital Ventures, alongside Andreessen Horowitz and Fidelity Ventures, values the company at $2.4 billion. The funding comes as Lime looks to expand into new markets and as Uber and Lyft push into the scooter business themselves. Joining us to discuss Bain Capital Ventures partner Sarah Smith. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. So the mania around scooters seems to have died down a little bit. So why come in with this much money at a $2 billion valuation? Oh, that's interesting. We have not seen the mania die down. In fact, over 2018, we saw probably the fastest consumer adoption of a new technology that I've ever seen, which is exactly why we dived in to figure out what's happening in this space. Um, I think the reason that people are very interested in this is that the reality is our cities are not set up for the future. We're seeing lots of congestion. And certainly the rideshare companies know that a lot of these trips are being done in the last mile. And so we decided to take a deep dive into the micromobility space and figure out if there was something to invest in. And at Bain Capital Ventures, we really like investing in early stage startups who are really transforming major industries. So this just felt like a clear area for us to understand. What about the competition from Uber, from Lyft? Yeah. Got deep pockets and are established. Yeah, definitely something a lot of people are thinking about. When we dug in, what we found was that actually managing a ride-sharing company, which is really a marketplace between drivers and riders, is very different from managing a physical fleet of e-vehicles. And so while they certainly know that there are a lot of their shares in this last mile, first mile, which frankly aren't really great um, experiences for consumers or for drivers, these shorter trips. So we know and expect that they will get involved. And indeed, we were actually invested a bit in Lime. Um, but managing the complex operation of a scooter fleet such that Lime does is a very different and challenging business to be in. Now, the other day I was walking across the street and I saw this guy on a scooter and he was going pretty fast and then he totally ate it, like fell off the scooter, oh, no. fell over. And I thought to myself, well, whose problem is that if he gets hurt? I mean, there, there are safety issues here. Mm -hmm. There are certain risks associated with this business. Who's going to be responsible for those risks? C certainly. So, Certainly any provider of scooters has to make sure they're putting really safe scooters out on the road. And that's something that Lime has been very committed to and has shown over but what time. about reckless driving? 
Well, same thing that you would see with reckless bike, bike riders, reckless drivers. I mean, um, at the end of the day, you have to provide a safe vehicle and encourage people to wear helmets and um, make sure that there's the right infrastructure. But if something happens, is, is Lime on the hook? Uh, I don't think if it's not about the vehicle, mm -hmm. certainly if it's the driver or the rider who's been irresponsible in the way they've used the vehicle, similar to how we would treat an automobile accident. So look, there are, you know, there are the safety issues, there are the weather issues, you know, mm -hmm. does this really work in, in winter or it's pouring down rain outside yep. right now, which obviously leads to a growth issue. What about all of those headwinds? Yeah, so winter, I kind of like to say that we're in V1 of winter if this were like a product. So we've learned a lot over the winter and certainly it will be even better next year. What's been interesting to see is that actually it's a, a lot more about precipitation, so snow or rain, than temperature. So a lot of people assume that colder temperatures would um, depress demand. That's not actually the case. What's the case is if there's rain or snow. If you think about it, if you're in the middle of Chicago and it's windy out and it's cold, you'd like to get there as fast as possible. If you could use a scooter to do that, you would do that. I used to ride my bike to, to school when I went to Madison for college in the middle of January. So micromobility can work in the winter, but certainly in precipitation, you have to be careful. And you're a big scooter yourself. I am. Why? What do you like so much about it? Well, certainly personally in San Francisco, I've experienced that um, traffic congestion has gotten much, much worse. I think anyone in a lot of major cities has experienced this. So I personally actually take Caltrain all the way up to the city to commute. And when I get off the Caltrain, I look for a scooter or an e-bike and have found it to be a far faster way for me to get to work than with uh, the bus. And it's actually fun. It's really fun to be able to start my day riding a scooter around the Embarcadero. It's a great way to start the day. Are you at all worried about the safety and durability of the scooters? I am not worried about the safety. I personally haven't experienced yeah. any concerns around that. What I do think is really important and probably the biggest key to safety is that cities are thinking about how do they create the infrastructure to enable what is inevitable, much more micromobility in the future. So do you think this is like the next Uber? Is it that big? I do. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll keep watching. <laughs> uh, Sarah Smith, partner at Bain Capital Ventures, thank you so much for stopping by. Thanks for having Good me. Good to have you here on the show. Coming up, we return to our lead story, the Jeff Bezos blackmail bombshell. How the allegations could affect Amazon's businesses and how there are two sides to this surveillance story. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Back to Amazon. Jeff Bezos' fight with the National Enquirer has been taken to a whole new level. Since the Amazon CEO's blog post Thursday night, the Enquirer's parent company, AMI, has said it will investigate the allegations, while federal prosecutors are now said to be reviewing the publisher's conduct, all of which could put Amazon's businesses, as well as Bezos' already tumultuous relationship with President Trump, at risk. Joining us to discuss, Eva Galperin, Director of Cybersecurity for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and Tim O'Brien, an executive editor of Bloomberg Opinion, who also wrote a biography of Donald Trump before he came, became president. So, Tim, got to ask, what is your unvarnished opinion of what has unfolded over the last 24 hours? Well, I mean, I think it's important to separate out uh, what, what Jeff Bezos is doing as an individual in the midst of his marriage breaking up. And, and clearly feeling like his privacy was invaded. I think that's one lens that, that's important to look at this through. I think the second is he's the owner of the Washington Post. And I think a lot of the uh, friction between uh, the White House and Bezos and the Washington Post stems out of the Washington Post's coverage of the Trump presidency. I don't think, you know, for Amazon investors, especially institutional investors, I don't think anything of the, anything about this signals a change at the top at Amazon or a threat to how Amazon's being managed. Jeff Bezos has a, a reasonable argument to make that he's, you know, he's one of the best corporate executives ever. Um, so I, I think what's really working, what's, look, what's worth looking at here is the issue he surfaced, which is the invasion of privacy or how easy it is uh, for personal information, texts and photographs to get stolen. And, and, and he has launched an investigation of how uh, AMI, the publisher of the National Enquirer, got its hands on private, private property photographs and texts. And I think that's an interesting thing to surface here. 
Eva, you are one of the foremost experts on this. How could the National Enquirer have gotten his private texts and photos, and hers? Well, there are a lot of different ways, and so the only thing that we can really do is speculate. Um, I think the most important thing to understand about uh, SMS text messages sent between phones is that they're not particularly secure, and that there are a lot of, uh, of sort of areas where somebody could step in and, uh, and intercept the text and send it to AMI. Additionally, uh, the endpoints could be insecure. It could be that somebody has broken into Jeff Bezos's phone or that somebody has broken into Jeff Bezos's partner's phone uh, because security is really only as strong as its weakest link. Or it could be as simple as maybe somebody sent a text or showed a phone to somebody else and that person sent it to the National Enquirer. Absolutely. Right? Once you send a message to someone, they can pass it right along and then you have no control over where it goes after that. Now, Tim, what do you think of the possible President Trump side of this story? I mean, Bezos names drops Trump, he name drops the Saudi government. Where could all this be going? Well, he's not, you know, he's not just name dropping without reason. Uh, David Pecker, the publisher of, of National Enquirer, is a longstanding friend of President Trump. We already know from um, uh, the investigations in the Southern District, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, um, that David Pecker, uh, Michael Cohen, a Trump attorney, and Trump himself jointly conspired to have the National Enquirer bury information about Trump's relationships uh, uh, with a porn star and an ex-playmate, um, and that they had a long-standing history of doing that for Trump, and that the National Enquirer was an advocate for Trump during the 2016 campaign. Um, so there's a long relationship there. Uh, I think it, it would be logical for Bezos to wonder why, when he's at, at kind of a peak battle with the president over everything from the tax rates that Amazon pay, pays on its shipping to the quality of the coverage in the Washington Post, to suddenly the National Enquirer get its hands on damning information. And essentially, uh, and I think as, as Bezos describes it correctly, uh, tries to both extort and blackmail him. This begins with, with, with the National Enquirer publishing a round of pictures um, uh, that, that's essentially stolen property in Bezos's view. He launches a, an investigation of that, and the National Enquirer comes back to him and says, we don't like this investigation of stolen property. In fact, we have more stolen property, and we're going to publish that unless you walk away. And I think to his credit, Bezos has said, I have the standing, the money, and I'm secure enough in my reputation that I'll take this one on. And so that's going to be the next interesting shoe to drop. What does Bezos's investigators uh, and, and, and probably any litigation that arises out of this reveal about the National Enquirer's relationship with the White House and with the political class generally and its own way of approaching journalism? Right, and Bezos has certainly teased that he expected more to come to light. Now, Eva, if it is so easy to get hands on our texts, our, our, our private photos, what can one do to prevent oneself? <laughs> So there are a couple from being of, so vulnerable. There are a couple of things that you can do in order to uh, protect your, uh, your pictures and your texts, um, largely depending on your threat model, who you're trying to protect them against and who you trust. Uh, when you send a picture to, a, to your partner or to a loved one, you are trusting them not to send that picture to somebody else. You can't really do anything to protect the endpoints. Um, but what you can do is you can uh, use an application which uh, deletes the pictures after a certain amount of time, which, uh, delay, which limits that person, the amount of time that that person has to pass the picture on. You can also use uh, an end-to-end -end encrypted um, application such as Signal or WhatsApp so that uh, your ISP uh, or the uh, company whose application you're using doesn't have access to these pictures. And so uh, anybody who is, uh, is spying on either one of those or is able to pressure either one of those can't get their hands on this information. So there are really a lot of options. Uh, EFF has written a guide to uh, practical security and, uh, and privacy online called Surveillance Self-Defense, and you can find it at ssd.eff.org. Thank you. Now, Tim, the president has not yet tweeted about this. In the past, he has been quite forthcoming with his Jeff Bozo 
tweets. He did tweet this morning, Ellie. He did. What, what did he say? <clears throat> he, uh, he called him Jeff Bozo this morning. He, he upped his old name-calling game, despite all the kumbaya of the, of the State of the Union address. Um, and, and, and he made, you know, he, he, he made pointed remarks about uh, Bezos' bad faith and why Bezos was pursuing this. It was probably, I don't know, it was, I think, around 11 a.m. Eastern time this morning. Um, you know, I, I think one thing to remember about these messages, about the, 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 the photos that were intercepted is they, they weren't just, you know, birthday wishes. These were very, you know, there's a round of 10 new uh, photographs that are in play. Four of them were innocuous. Three of them were of his mistress. And she was in a bikini. I don't think they were anything that was scandalous. But there were three, you know, of, of, uh, of um, Jeff Bezos's genitals. And I have a hard time believing that the CEO of Amazon, who has to be security conscious and privacy conscious, was just going to let those particular kind of emails go willy-nilly out on streams. Perhaps he's that reckless. Maybe we need to question his judgment. But I think he's a fairly disciplined an aware person. And, and I think those three, that, that subset of the three photographs, um, if they actually didn't circulate beyond uh, just, just Jeff Bezos and his mistress, gets us back to this question of how do they get them. Uh, the other thing to remember, I think, is that any time that Donald Trump tweets at people, he's usually not doing it from a position of strength, whether it's Robert Mueller, Adam Schiff, or now Jeff Bezos. He tends to do it when he feels threatened. And uh, I think the fact that that you know over the last and, few and years, hang hang on Tim I, I I gotta I gotta correct you because he actually has the president has not tweeted about this yet today the last time he did tweet about Jeff Bezos uh, he called him Jeff Jeff Bozos was in reference to the National Enquirer's expose hmm. about the divorce which happened back in January and I do have that tweet which which okay. which read so sorry to hear the news about Jeff Bozo being taken down by a competitor whose reporting I understand is far more accurate than the reporting in his lobbyist newspaper. Paper, the Amazon Washington Post. Hopefully, the paper will soon be placed in better and more responsible hands. So, knowing that the president has so far kept quiet about this over the last 24 hours, who no knows what's going to happen in the next five minutes? What's your take? Well, thank you for correcting me. I would still say I don't expect him to stay quiet about this. I think um, uh, it, it would not be in keeping with who he is when he's confronted by what I think he perceives to be a threat. And, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos is the wealthiest man on the planet. He has ample resources. He's clearly um, irked by what has occurred here, and he's intending to pursue it. So, uh, you know, it's going to be yet another sort of line of inquiry surrounding the president that should concern the president. He's got, right. you know, a number of people taking a look at his activities. So, Eva, there, there is another side to this story, which, you know, some critics of, of Bezos' moves here have, have pointed out some level of hypocrisy because Amazon uh, surveils us in certain ways, collects a lot of data about our shopping habits. There's the whole Alexa thing. There's the recognition, facial recognition technology that Amazon is developing. Um, of course, it's a very different kind of, 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 of surveillance. But do you see the irony there? I think that the primary difference between the type of surveillance that, uh, that Amazon and indeed most of what we call surveillance capitalism engages in and someone possibly uh, breaking into phones or intercepting messages uh, in order to send them to the National Enquirer to publish them to embarrass uh, someone, uh, the, the primary difference here is consent. Mm -hmm. um, there is a major issue with uh, the surveillance capitalism platforms and the way in which they manufacture consent on, on the part of, of their users, but this is really much more severe. This is a completely different level of, um, of betrayal, and it is not really cut from the same cloth, in my opinion. Agreed. All right. Eva Galperin of EFF, thank you so much. Tim O'Brien, can't wait to hear <laughs> how your opinions evolve on this. Uh, our Bloomberg Opinion Executive Editor, thank you both. Coming up, a female-founded startup raises $30 million to take on the retail industry with its own direct-to-consumer operations. This is Bloomberg.
Direct to consumer clothing and accessories brand Kuyana launched in 2011, hoping shoppers would buy into their philosophy of fewer, better things. Seven years later, the company is profitable and just closed a $30 million funding round with HIG Growth Partners. The private equity firm says Kuyana will be the next billion dollar brand. So, how do you achieve that while asking your customer to buy less? For our Retail Transform series, Bloomberg's Emma Chanyar spoke with Kuyana co founder and CEO Carla Gallardo. When we launched the brand in 2011, um, the market was crowded with uh, very low quality products or high quality products that were overpriced. And um, the, the, the motto, fewer better, came in at a time where consumers' closets were full, but they weren't really full of meaningful products. And um, this, this is about intentional buying and intentional living. And it's a philosophy that actually ends up being a peaceful philosophy for our consumer to live by. And uh, it turns out that when you're a brand that sells fewer, but better products, um, consumers just fall in love with it and come back for more. They come back and they buy from you uh, second and third times. Absolutely. Our mission is to give confidence and ease to women in today's world. And when our products deliver on that and she uses those products to elevate her in her day, um, she will come back for more and we won't disappoint her. Unlike many other direct-to-consumer brands, you started both online and in a physical uh, location. Why that omni-channel approach right from the beginning? Yes. Yeah, Back in 2011, brands were getting started with the, uh, with the emphasis on online only. And uh, back then, we, we, we thought, well, you know, a customer needs to touch and feel. And really, retail may not be going uh, uh, anywhere in a while. Um, the, crowded is, the, sorry, the market is going to get crowded with, um, with um, a lot of brands trying to advertise digitally. Those costs are going to really peak. And while everybody is ignoring retail, let's take advantage of those spaces that are currently open, test through pop-ups learn as much as we can so that when we're ready, we can start signing permanent leases and really um, move forward with that channel. And you have five permanent stores at the moment. We currently have five and plans to open more. We also just closed uh, $30 million in growth financing um, from private equity company HIG Growth Partners. Um, what is that funding for? Is that to expand your brick and mortar presence? It really is to expand and amplify what we've been doing um, so far, and um, it, it, it's a three-prone approach. Uh, we are expanding retail, we are expanding our brand footprint of Fewer Better, and we are expanding our product line. And in order to do those three really well and very seamlessly to the customer, requires a lot of investment in the backbone of our business, which is a very complex tech stack. Uh, it's an omni-channel tech stack, uh, lots of systems, lots of data, and uh, really gifted people to be able to do this really well so that our customer has a, an experience that's very personal and uh, does not feel technical. What about technology? How does that help your business or how do you leverage technology at Kuyana? Oof, it's everything for us and we, we started with a very uh, precise um, way of viewing fashion which was actually um, through data. We, we really t uh, took value in data collection and building a tech stack that supports all channels and that can scale uh, and, and, and build an experience from a consumer standpoint that is completely seamless. Um, our systems are incredibly complex, and so our investment there has been um, very um, strong. Uh, direct to consumer for us is not only to um, create an optimized supply chain and deliver product without an intermediary so that the customer gets an incredible price. It's also getting to know that customer so that the business can continue to evolve through time. So we've been really focused on collecting data points in every single one of the touch points and owning each one of those. And so in terms of talking about data and collecting data to better know your customer, how much does that impact uh, product in innovation? How does that impact inventory? Does that help you decide between what might be working, why not what might might not be working and perhaps what products to add uh, to the roster of Kiana. Yes, all the time and all of the above. Um, I love that our design team is incredibly interested in data too and, and we always joke around about that but data actually influences even the the launch of every, the kickoff of every season that we have. Um, the I think I would say that the best value add is really an inventory because we have products that um, stay with us for many, many years and so we get really, really good at predicting the sales of each one of those products 
every month, the color allocation, the size allocation, um, the seasonality curves, and we, we, we were masters of that. So, so you limit unsold product, essentially. Exactly. We, we are very good at never overproducing. Uh, now, again, your new investors uh, predict that you'll become a billion dollar brand. You could rival the likes of Coach. How do you plan to do that? Well, we're excited. That's why we started the business. Um, the first thing was product. Um, product was the, the white gap and, uh, and the big opportunity and need in the market. And we've done that really well and we've, we've, we've done that now at scale. And so it really is continuing to do that um, uh, and, 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 and grow more categories. Um, Fewer Better ends up being a lifestyle uh, that is really uh, relevant to today. Should that happen, uh, what does the future hold? Are you going to go public? Are you going to be acquired? What do you want to do? You know, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, I think of Kuyana as the place where I'll work forever, uh, where I hope my children end up working in, and uh, and uh, whether we get acquired or eventually go public, it will really just depend on uh, on, on an exit plan that preserves the values of where, of how we started and that preserves that brand. But you are thinking about these possibilities. Oh, absolutely, actively. yes. Uh, we want Kuyana to touch every woman's lives, and our goal is to be a global brand that's recognized as the destination of your better things. That was Carla Gallardo, Kuyana co-founder and CEO with Bloomberg's Emma Chandra. Well, Chinese tech giant Huawei has threatened legal action against the Czech Republic if the country's cybersecurity agency does not reverse a warning about the risk the company poses to the nation's critical infrastructure. This according to reports. U.S. government officials and industry execs have long harbored suspicions that it works for Chinese government interests. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is set to visit Europe next week and plans to tell European allies that the U.S. expects them not to abet rivals. Still ahead, we go inside Shenzhen's robot revolution that aims to manufacture its famous electronics faster and cheaper. This is Bloomberg. There will be a new chair at Verizon, the largest wireless carrier in the United States. Lowell McAdam is stepping down after seven years. Hans Vestberg, who took over as CEO in August, will take over as chairman. Vestberg recently completed an overhaul of Verizon, zeroing in on network services and the expansion into 5G technology. In the latest episode of Hello World, Ashley Vance visits Zowie, a factory in Shenzhen that makes cheap smartphones and electronics thanks to the hard work of human factory employees. But new machines are coming online that can build a smartphone end-to-end, -end, completely by robot. Here's Ashley Vance. Zowie operates a factory much like any other in Shenzhen. They make cheap smartphones and other electronics. Like other top manufacturers, they've built a complex where workers can live right beside the factory line, work around the clock for a couple of years, and hopefully buy a better life for their families back home. The factories here are clean, and the work is precise. But things are changing quickly in a way that does not favor the common man and woman. All the rest of these lines are staffed by about 80 people. But right here, there's new machines coming online that are going to build a smartphone end to end completely by robot. The end goal of something like this is to get the quality of the products higher, to bring costs down for less labor, and ultimately to keep China as the manufacturing hub of the world and fend off low price competition from places like Southeast Asia. The factory of the future looks like this. It's a closed off loop where robots pass components among each other and finished products pop out at the end. All those workers have been replaced by one lonely final inspector. It's a strong sign that the future of Shenzhen is less for these guys and more for these guys. Zowie actually builds these automation machines itself. Behind me are some of China's best and brightest engineers, hard at work building the machines you see out on the floor today and the ones that are coming tomorrow that are gonna automate the entire factory line. Nowhere will face more turmoil than Shenzhen as the robots rise and send millions of workers to the unemployment line. 
You can catch the full episode of Hello World at Bloomberg.com. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology on Monday's show. We will be talking with the CEO of Sonos, Patrick Spence, about the company's latest earnings and supply chain challenges out of China. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology and follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. I'm Emily Chang from San Francisco. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. This is Bloomberg.